Okay, as uh, Abhishek mentioned, there are a lot of uh, things at play at the moment. Um, you know, we've got uh, inflation, the uh, geopolitical situation, uh, growth concerns, many, many things which feed into shipping, of course. So I thought a good way to start was to look at those macro issues. Uh, and we, I have on the stage uh, with me, I have Sarah Hewin, who's head of research, Europe and the Americas uh, from uh, Standard Chartered. And uh, Tim Power, who's managing director from Drury. So I'm just going to post a few questions. Uh, we'll have a kind of general discussion and perhaps we'll open up to the floor at the end. So Sarah, first one to you. Let me move you like this. Yeah. Okay, Sarah. So a year ago today, uh, there was no war in Ukraine. There was pretty much optimism about a post-COVID economic uh, surge. Uh, and generally things looked uh, pretty good, actually. So what went wrong? Yes, I mean, if we look back a year, I think we were still somewhat nervous about Omicron. We didn't know um, <clears throat> how big an impact that was going to deliver, but we were getting signs that although it was highly transmissible, uh, the impact was going to be less severe than with previous variants. Um, and of course, we ha had been expecting a, a recovery in economic activity. Inflation was, was picking up and there were some geopolitical tensions, some hints of tensions emerging. So um, it, there were some inflation pressures. But if we go back to what the uh, Bank of England, for example, was expecting for inflation round about now, it was um, looking for 5% inflation. I mean, the latest inflation numbers have been over 10%. So that's been the, the, the big shock. Um, the, the global economy actually held up better than feared, uh, not quite as well as expected, but um, we saw global growth of about 3.4% last year, which is around about the... Uh, long-term average. Uh, the, the two big shocks, though, of course, were the, well, the very big shock was the uh, invasion of, of Ukraine and the dramatic impact that that had on inflation. So any talk of tra inflation being transitory disappeared pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we've seen central banks really having to take dramatic action. If we go back a year ago, the Fed, ECB, Bank of England, most central banks, apart from uh, some in Latin America and, and in Eastern Europe, uh, had not started to raise rates at all and had no intention of, of raising rates as fast as we've seen. Um, the other uh, development, of course, has been the impact of um, the, the lockdowns in China, really trying to deal with this highly transmissible um, variant required tighter and tighter restrictions, and that's had a dramatic impact on China's economy. Um, the opening up now um, and the uh, uh, sort of pandemic uh, sweeping across the country has also been reflected in, in very weak economic activity there. Um, so uh, outlook for this year, more positive in let's many let's aspects. Let's go there later on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we'll discuss a bit more about China later on as well, yeah. Uh, Tim, perhaps, you know, those same issues, I mean, my question is, you know, how has shipping had to adapt to everything that happened during sort of 2022? You know? Well, a, a lot. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that global energy trades effectively have to be rewired. Um, uh, you know, as, as Europe reduces its dependence on Russian gas and on oil, um, where is, where is the gas coming from? So the LNG market, which has always been very Asia-orientated, became very European-orientated. Um, you've got FSRUs being deployed in Europe, um, which went, you know, there were a few before, but now there are uh, several and more coming. So uh, the, the gas trade com completely changed. Um, the crude oil trade also, um, as EU bans Russian crude imports, um, where is that oil now going? Of course, it's going to Asia, it's going to India, it's going to China. Um, so lots of changes going on in all of these energy trades. Um, and then, of course, you have the effect on the dry bulk trade, which has contracted in, in 2022 um, as a result of, of as, as Sarah's described, of the uh, weak economic activity in, in China. And, and then, we haven't talked about containers yet, um, where having been through this, this sort of COVID, uh, and we're going to discuss this in a bit more detail, but the COVID period, of course, extraordinary um, earnings for the shipping lines. What we saw in the middle of the year is suddenly 
US demand is just evaporating. Uh, and I have never, I've been in the industry for a very long time, I've never seen a contraction in container demand uh, as I've seen in North America in the second half of this year. I couldn't believe the numbers. So, and so that, that industry is now suddenly realizing this isn't just a month blip. This is, uh, and, and you've seen the, the average rates that we publish in our uh, World Container Index every week. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's like a fighter aircraft that's been shot down. Um, so the question is, can it pull up before it hits the deck? So an enormous amount to be grappling with. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, Sarah, again, um, if I might ask, and delving a bit deeper into it, um, and interest rates and inflation in particular, um, you know, how much impact will that have on economic growth in maybe we could sort of split it into Europe, US, world? Um, because I think that's a major concern to a lot of people during the year. Yes, absolutely. And I think the concern is that we probably haven't seen the full impact of ra higher interest rates yet. Um, so we've seen European Central Bank raising rates by 250 basis points, probably with another 125 to come. Uh, we've seen the Fed raising rates by 425 basis points. We think another 25 to come uh, before we get to the terminal rate. But we know that the impact will be felt with, with some lag. And we already have signs of weakness. Um, I mean, the European economies, in fact, uh, have, have not been as badly hit as feared. Uh, the um, build in, in gas stocks has reduced energy prices dramatically and um, demand uh, or use of, of energy has contracted without uh, a big hit to, to the economy. Nevertheless, the, the tightening of policy, um, the uh, impact on the squeeze on real incomes, we think, is going to hold growth very weak over the coming quarters. I mean, for the US, it's a, it's a similar story, and we do have some evidence already, as Tim was saying, um, that, that, that goods consumption has really softened quite a lot in the second half of the year. We're starting now just to see signs that services activity is, is fading as well. Thinking about the rest of the world, uh, that there perhaps is sort of more optimism. I mean, I know we're going to come on to, to China later, um, but for example, in Southeast Asia, for the ASEAN countries, we are seeing um, a, a, a very a relatively positive environment. Central banks um, haven't tightened rates by nearly as much. Uh, they're pretty much at an end in that respect. Domestic demand is reasonably good. There's still an element of the post-COVID bounce there. Um, so uh, that, that, I think that's a, an area of, of, of optimism. Okay, thank you. And Tim, with that reduced economic growth, assuming we see it, um, that'll mean less consumer demand, and that will, of course, sort of cause less demand for shipping, especially in the dry and container services. So where's the impact there? Well, uh, uh, whenever we do any, any studies related to container shipping, we all see there's this extremely strong correlation between GDP and container volume. And, and it's very easy to see, you know, buying power in Western economies translates into strong import demand. Um, and similarly, uh, p poor economic growth means uh, reduced um, import demand. So, and, and I think this is, this is what we're seeing in, in North America now, as I said, the, you know, extraordinary slowdown. Um, and ve also very weak um, uh, growth in, in, in uh, North Europe as well. So, so absolutely. Um, I, I think that the, you know, if we, this is not um, con necessarily consumer demand. If we look at China, um, you know, if we say, uh, if, if the, uh, the biggest, you know, biggest player in shipping uh, really, anyway, um, but particularly if we look at the at iron ore, at coal, you know what will happen to Chinese steel if Chinese economic activity is weak. You know if the property market became even more. I mean, I, I understand that you know seven percent decline in new housing starts last year. Um, so if if China is weak, then that has a huge knock-on impact on on these um, big uh, big dry bulk trades. So absolutely right. Yeah, you know, low low growth means. Uh, really constrained shipping demand. Okay, thank you. And and I guess I mean the pro we we read a lot about the property market, don't we? And with the rise in sort of mortgage rates, there's a lot of concern, a huge amount of concern in this country and all other countries that uh, you know households are going to have a real 
sort of a push on their sort of con uh, consumer uh, their ability to sort of spend on other things aren't they? absolutely and that and that's i mean we, we've probably come on to this but if you're a, if you're in the container shipping industry now um uh, with where we have this uh, an order book equivalent to 30 percent of the fleet which will start to be delivered this year this the question of managing that capacity um and we also have, and we could probably touch on this also, but this unwinding of congestion, which means that actually capacity is going to be going up even more. A colossal challenge for the industry, colossal. So congestion, you believe, is now more or less fixed? Yeah, um, I mean, maybe we'll just talk a little bit about that. Um, we, um, those of you not in container shipping, um, but bore, apologies if I bore you with this, but there's a golden rule in container shipping. You must have your utilization on your head haul at 90% if you're going to maintain stable freight rates and if you're going to make money. What that means is there's really very little buffer. Um, in the container shipping industry, it's very lean. Uh, and so when you get things like COVID and knock-on um, effects on um, supply chain efficiency, it very quickly soaks up all surplus capacity. So in, we calculated in 2020, 11% of effective container shipping capacity was soaked up by COVID-related disruptions. That went up to 17% in 2021 and similar levels in 2022. In other words, if you were a shipper wanting to move stuff, you were very lucky to get space and, the, and you would pay anything to get it. Um, and so that's essentially the root of, of these earnings that have been beyond the dreams of avarice for the last two years. But um, as Kevin says, that is now unwinding and um, uh, port congestion, we expect, will, will absorb only th maybe 3% of capacity this year. So essentially, it's almost over. Um, and that means that that 17% um, that or that 14% of capacity that, is, that have been taken out is now back um, without having to put another ship on the water. So this is a, a, a huge, uh, huge thing that the industry has to manage. Thank you. And Sarah, delving a little bit more into China, I mean, um, from an economic perspective, what can we expect to see, do you think, over the coming year from the opening up of China post this uh, you know, three-year uh, lockdown? Well, I think let's look at the example of Europe and the US past, post the first pandemic wave. There was a huge surge in consumer spending, obviously supported, particularly supported in the US by uh, Washington uh, handouts. But we saw consumer spending rising by 15% in the 12 months after the first pandemic wave in Europe, by 25%. This is in real terms after the first pandemic wave in the US. And we're expecting to see um, a good news story for China from the consumer. Uh, there's pent-up savings. That's been a big part of the story in the US and Europe as well over this period. Uh, in China, pent-up savings, pent-up demand, and um, certainly, you know, we think that that's going to be a major driver of growth. We've got a growth forecast of 5.8% for this year for China, which is uh, comfortably above consensus. But we think that the majority of that is going to be consumer spending. On the property side, the, you know, there's been a lot of gloom, obviously, about the uh, property market in China. Um, we're not expecting that to be, in any sense, a, a driver of growth, but equally, we think Beijing is doing enough to uh, put a floor under it. So it's no longer likely to be a drag on economic activity. Okay. So in, in shipping terms, do you think this sort of likely growth in Chinese consumer spending may compensate for the issues which uh, Tim mentioned? In I, I think so. I mean, we, we think that we'll have weakness in, in US and Europe in the first half of the year. Um, this current quarter may be soft uh, for China as well, of course, but we see in the second quarter a real sort of rebound in China. Um, and then by the end of the year, we may be in a situation where we certainly see a pickup in the US and China doing well as well. Okay, Tim, I mean, uh, I think what we did learn from uh, COVID is that um, there is a, a sort of a risk to uh, globalization because a lot of countries realize that it's probably better to near source products than uh, rely on places at the other uh, side of the world. So is globalization sort of uh, coming to an end or, or, or is the attraction to it you know, waning? Well, uh, if, if, uh, 
we, we did some work on this at the beginning of the pandemic, and of course, all the effects that you would, you, you would need to see hadn't obs been observed by them, but what, what we looked at was how has the composition of trade evolved over the last decade, has, what has happened to com comparative proportions of intercontinental and um, regional. And we found actually in that decade, it hadn't shifted. So there was pre-pandemic no sign of deglobalization de in our view. Um, if we look at more recent evidence, um, the value of uh, US imp uh, imports into the US from China um, was at a record in 2022. So um, in those very simple measures, uh, it doesn't look like it. Um, but uh, having said that, um, there's absolutely no doubt that supply chain resilience is really critical and is something that I, I think probably a lot of shippers have taken for granted um, and won't do in future. So there, you know, people talk about China plus one, for example. Um, we saw in the, in the US-China trade war that um, China lost share in the US trade. It lost 5% of its US trade share, but uh, what happened was it, it didn't go to the US or Mexico, it went to Vietnam, which grew by about 30%. So um, I think there's going to be diversification of supply, but, uh, and the other thing, there was a recent study um, uh, sponsored by D uh, Dubai Ports World, which looked at, or it was a survey of executives, what are you thinking about in terms of your supply chain? Very interesting. The same proportion were looking at nearshoring as were looking at actually extending and diversifying their supply chains overseas. So I think the jury's out. Okay. I, I echo that in terms of the experience that, that, that we've seen where um, absolutely um, countries like Vietnam, Philippines, um, have, uh, Thailand, Malaysia have uh, sort of benefited as uh, producers diversify their sources. So uh, we're not seeing, uh, we're seeing some nearshoring as well, but um, the, the sort of broad trend is still for uh, Asia to be the source of a lot of the production. Very good. Yep, thank you. Uh, Sarah, on, on to you again. I'm just wondering, you know, so post the Ukraine uh, war, whether the bank has a view on, you know, the possibility of other geopolitical skirmishes. I mean, the one that everybody seems to be talking about is China, Taiwan, um, and whether you're now sort of inputting that kind of stuff into your economic models going forward. Yes, I mean, there was certainly a lot of discussion about um, China-Taiwan risks in the immediate aftermath of, of the invasion, um, the close relations between China and Russia. Um, I think the, um, the example of the sort of Russia-Ukraine war, how it's really galvanized support from uh, the West and um, enhanced cooperation uh, from uh, amongst um, Western governments, uh, that, that that message has been sort of very clear. Um, and, and in fact, what we're seeing uh, increasingly is, is a pivot, I would say, um, with, with China um, seeking to uh, enhance and improve its, its foreign relations more recently. For example, we've, you know, there was sort of very uh, sort of extended tensions between China and Australia, um, and we're now seeing a sort of different mood music coming um, from, from Beijing. Uh, so I, th I think that uh, that's, that's uh, um, you know, tensions in the South China Sea will, will remain, but we don't see that as a, a sort of major geopolitical event any time soon. Um, but there are probably other areas that we would want to keep an eye on in, in the Middle East, um, and we've got elections coming up um, in Turkey, in Nigeria, so plenty to, to keep us busy. Okay, thank you. So just a, a general, just to we'll perhaps open up to the floor in a moment, uh, just to both of you really, I mean, are you generally optimistic or generally more pessimistic perhaps about shipping will be, how shipping will be impacted over the next 12 to 24 months from what the global economy is doing? Uh, Sarah, just, perhaps I'll sort of pitch up on the, uh, <laughs> the sort of backdrop. I mean, I think that, um, you know, trade, global trade is, is under pressure and certainly in an environment where you have weakness, as we're expecting in, in Europe and in the US in the first half of the year, then that's, uh, uh, you know, not a particularly positive environment. Having said that, the um, recovery in China, which we, we think will be 
much better than people are expecting um, should be should be positive and and later this year again coming out of that should be uh, you know see global trade recovering to where we would normally expect it to be and and it depends on which shipping market you're looking at I, I mean people talk about the shipping industry but I think it's an oversimplification so if, if, if we say I think you know the energy related uh, sectors at, um, gas and, and tankers for the, for the next 24 months look quite bright to us. Uh, I think if there's a strong recovery in China, that will be good for dry. Uh, I think the, the, the sector where, um, and particularly now we've had this announcement that, uh, that the Maersk um, MSC2M alliance will come to an end, um, that, that there's going to be a lot of turbulence in the container sector. And I think we would probably, uh, yeah, pessimism is probably uh, not the right word, um, but it's going to be really challenging. Thank you. Let me just open it up to the floor and see if we have any uh, questions. Any questions, please? Yes, sir. Good morning. If I could sneak in two questions. So first question, if we end up with two-ish percent global growth or less, what do you think that means for crude oil demand? Second question is, what do you read into the breakup between Maersk and MSC? Um, in terms of, of crude oil demand, so 2% is a little bit lower than the global growth outlook that we have for this year, but we are expecting something in the order of about 2.4%. So, um, and we see demand um, staying soft. I mean, we've had a lot of questions from clients about whether the China recovery um, means that we'll see oil prices up over $100 a barrel. Our commodities research team um, still see oil prices in a sort of uh, 85 to $90 a barrel range with the, the sort of soft um, Western demand offsetting the recovery in China. If we're at 2% or below, then that's a, a pretty weak outlook for the global economy, and it would suggest that, that oil demand is, is going to be weaker and oil prices will be at the lower end of that range. But of course, the supply impact will be affected. We know that OPEC will want to maintain prices over $80 a barrel, so it would probably make an adjustment to output. And on your second question, um, I mean, for, for people like me who are in this, in, who are in this industry for a long time, um, the, the big surprise was actually that Maersk and MSC got together in the first place. Um, two less well-matched partners, it would, frankly, at that time, would be hard to imagine. So, um, but why it's breaking up, um, Maersk is pursuing a very different strategy to the one that it had um, when the alliance was formed. You know, Maersk was always going to be out in front, leading the charge on economies of scale, network development, and absolutely determined to stay as number one. They have adopted, as you know, the, um, a new corporate strategy of becoming a, a global integrator of container shipping services, and a strategy, fr frankly, having uh, in P&O containers worked on something similar that I don't think will work. Um, they, have, they have changed their focus, saying we, we don't believe in the old container shipping business model, we believe in a new logistics focused business model. And that means that they, they have let that leadership go. And, and MSC will be thinking, we're now tied to somebody who has a very different agenda to us. Um, and this isn't going to work. So um, Soren Toft moves in, um, obviously um, the, the Apontis will say, right, we, we have to break free of this. So th they've gone out and they have bought a vast number of ships um, so that they are, they are strong enough to go on their own. Um, and, and you can see that in some of their container terminal activities as well. So um, it, it's a divergence of strategy. It is MSC wanting to stick with the old model, which frankly I believe is correct in liner shipping, which is uh, scale. Um, Musk focusing on something else and now being um, unsuitable. Uh, and I, I think the, 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 it will be a big challenge for Musk now um, as to how they manage this because they are they're, they're too big to fit into one of the other alliances uh, and, and I'm not sure that the regulators would allow them, but they're too small to be on their own. So this is a big quandary for them. Okay, another question please. No, let yes, sir, yes, sir. Good morning, thanks for the interesting discussion. I have a question in relation to the decarbonization 
um, discussion that is going on around the world, and how do you feel that it's going to impact uh, shipping liner companies going forward? Well, um, I, th I think it's enormously challenging because we don't, frankly, have the, the technological solutions uh, to, to a decarbonized container shipping world that we know are going to work. Um, and we were discussing this earlier. I mean, hydrogen as a fuel is very challenging. Got to carry it at minus 250, takes up more space. Um, how are you going to create it in the first place? You know, you, it, to make it a, a really green fuel, it has to be generated by renewable energy. Um, so, so this creating these fuels, distributing them, and then handling them on the ships. I mean, ammonia is horrifically um, poisonous. Um, um, even methanol, we understand, has uh, you know potentially serious effects on on uh, crew in the engine room. So. Uh, the, Although there's a lot of talk about the fuels, I really don't think they're there yet. Um, and so it, it's, it, we are, as an industry being told, we must decarbonize. And of course, that's understood. But actually, how are we going to do it? I'm not sure the answer. I mean, I think we have, we have some stuff on this later, which we listen to with great interest. But I think it's extremely difficult. Sarah, do you have a input or we'll move on i'm going to defer to okay this. very good let's, let's just finish with a couple of predictions then for like end of this year end of 2023 where where are we going to be do you think uh, you know u.s u.s inflation and u.s interest rates uh, sarah where do you think we're going to end the year um so u.s interest rates we're expecting um uh, cutting rates in the second half of the year so we see the fed funds rate up about at 425. Mm -hmm. um in terms of u.s inflation Core inflation, we think, could be down to 2.4% in the fourth quarter. Okay. Tim, do you agree there? I, I'm not a macroeconomist. I'm going to defer totally to Sarah <laughs> on this. Please ignore me. Okay, very good. But if, if that's the case, it's really quite, quite positive, really, isn't it, that we're, we're going to turn the corner quite soon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it does make life a lot easier for policymakers and for households. So that's a, 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 a and look at what's happening already. Energy prices are falling, goods prices are falling. Um, it's a question of what happens to services prices. That's the issue. Okay, very good. Uh, Tim, perhaps oil price end of the year? Any view on that? That's not you either. Sarah? Um, yes, I think we have a, an oil price of $91 a barrel by the end of the year for, for Brent. Um, again, um, sort of softer in the, in the interim, um, picking up towards the end of the year. Okay. So generally, the, the, the story is moderately positive, I would say, from what I'm hearing. Is that right, Tim, for the year ahead in terms of sort of economic outlook and the impact on shipping? Uh. Depending on, the, depending on the sector, of course? Yeah, I would say moderately positive. Yeah, moderately positive, yeah. Depe sector dependent. And a lot of it, you know, if China gets, gets back on its feet, I think that's, right. uh, that's really critical. Sarah, you agree moderately positive? Yes, I think by this time next year, our, our view would be that we're, we're through the worst of the US and European downturns um, and that we see a sort of good story for China. Well, I think you know, moderate, moderately positive is a good way to start the agenda, uh, the, uh, the the conference today. So I'm I'm pretty happy about that. Tim and Sarah, thank you very much.